Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. This is our um, last uh, intervention in terms of, of speakers and, and uh, panelists. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce Kari Kogoranta from WTT. Both the speakers will introduce themselves and um, Stephanie Wright from King's College in, in the UK. Um, what we are going to talk about in this panel is a little bit about various types of solutions. What, what is the future? What can we do to actually uh, solve some of the very significant problems we've had uh, during th these last 24 hours? So, um, without further ado, uh, Kari, do you want to start? Tell yes. me a little bit about your yes. background and the type of work you do. Yes. So, my name is Kari Koivranta and I'm principal scientist uh, from VTT Technical Research, Inst Research Center of Finland. Uh, my background is biochemist and I have been at VTT modified different kind of microbes so, so that they are producing some wanted products uh, from different kind of raw materials. Nowadays I'm leading this kind of uh, pro process called plastic, Plastpack where we are looking for that how in, by using biotech we can uh, reuse plastic waste material to generate this kind of uh, valuable products by different kind of microbes or enzymes. That's shortly <laughs> what I'm doing. Thank you. Stephanie. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie Wright, and I'm a research fellow at King's College. Um, so I work on microplastics. I've been in the field for about eight years now. And uh, my background is marine microplastics and impacts on invertebrates. Uh, but for the last three or four years, I've actually been working on airborne microplastics. Um, so the potential for these plastic particulates to aerosolize, uh, the potential for human exposure to them, and uh, we're just starting to work on what those effects might be associated with exposure. So, not solutions, but I'm going to try and do my best here anyway. <laughs> right, so originally we had also planned to have someone from the investment community who might be looking at sort of what kind of financial models would we have to find solutions. So, in order to cover that a little bit also, I'll, I'll try to uh, do a little bit of that myself. Now, what I also hoped to do was to see if they're sort of people in the audience who have been thinking about this uh, during this symposium, who might have some ideas that might want to discuss some other solutions. But uh, perhaps to, to kick it off, Stephanie, when we talk about the types of human impacts that we have, where would you see the most serious ones being right now? So, um, obviously, I have a bias towards microscopic particulates. Um, I think the key thing at the moment is we actually don't really know what our exposure looks like. So we're really technologically challenged with what we can see when we start to focus on the smaller size classes. But it's those smaller size classes that are biologically important because they can interact with cells um, and potentially biodistribute in the body. Um, so a key sort of risk, I guess, if you like, is the unknowns when it comes to humans. We don't know what we're exposed to, how small those particles get and what happens to them in the body. Um, second to that, if we are exposed to microplastics, I think the real, one of the real questions is what contribution do they have towards uh, triggering aberrant inflammation? So do they have the capacity to cause inflammation and how does that scale in comparison to all the other particles we are exposed to anyway? Um, and then coming from it at a slightly different angle, I think in terms of the macroplastics, um, there's a real risk, as we've heard already, for, for pathogens and the sort of pathogenic transfer that can occur from the colonization of these plastics in the environment. So that's a rather grim picture. I mean, uh, thinking <laughs> about it, uh, there's a lot of unknowns here. And normally, as humans, when it comes to our own health, we are quite concerned with this. Can you give us some sort of estimate of how much money is going into this type of research? I mean, how many groups are out there, would you say, that are working on this type of problem? And how close are we? Are we sort of at the age of the Middle Ages when it comes to understanding our health? Or are we getting into the 19th century? Or, or you know, when are we going to be up to speed? Um, so I'd say we are, I think we're, we're looking in that there are well-established fields when it comes to particle toxicology. And so there are a lot of paradigms that we have already from, say, the nanotoxicology field um, and for considering particles because they typically do use polystyrene beads as a, as a particle to work on because you can modify the surface, you can buy it in predefined size, sizes. 
But um, of course, what we've also heard is that's not very relevant compared to what we're exposed to. So really, this microplastic term is a big umbrella term for all different kinds of polymeric particles which have been environmentally weathered and conditioned. Um, so how much translation there is from those fields is questionable. Um, there are now a couple, you know, a few groups seem to be doing things. There's a few papers coming out documenting uh, microplastic uptake in cell culture, so looking at gastrointestinal cell lines um, and looking at inflammation in those cell lines. Um, in terms of uh, um, inhalation exposure and sort of the microplastics we find in the environment, there's actually very little work that's been done so far. And so I think it feels new, but I'm sure there's lots of people working on this now because it is such an urgent research gap. So we've had a lot of discussions about diesel cars and their effects of humans living in cities. And there's sort of a movement right now to banning diesel cars in many bigger cities. Would you say that what's coming off the tires of a diesel car is more toxic to humans than what is actually coming out the back of the pipe? Um. I don't know about more toxic. I mean, it's certain, certainly complicated because you've got synthetic rubber, you've got black carbon, you've got mineral oil, you've got so many different components. And actually, as a tire degrades, uh, the size distribution of particles it emits have different compositions. So typically, the very small nanoscale particles are actually mineral oil. And so you've almost got a, a compositional change with the size distribution coming off the, the tires. Um, but I think uh, what is important is actually our efforts and, and emphasis on reducing diesel emissions is ultimately positive and is working to a degree now that the diesel emissions are reducing. But what that means is the flux, there's a flux of, uh, of particles to, to different compositions. So we're reducing diesel emissions, but that means in the total particles, we've got now we've got a sort of increase, if you like, of tyre wear abundance. Uh, so I think in the future, it's definitely going to be important. Right. So turning more in terms of what can we do with the plastic legacy. So, of course, we, we all know we've been putting the plastic out there for, I guess, about 60 years now, but it's accelerated. So we have a lot more plastic now in the marine environment. A lot more of it is getting into smaller and smaller pieces. What do you think, what are the plausible solutions to this problem? Well, there is... There is not only one solution, and I hope that there is many solutions. Uh, because, uh, of course, uh, like in previous, it has been told uh, here that uh, the major problem is that uh, there will not come more plastic uh, waste, so that we are replacing this uh, plastic with this kind of uh, reusable uh, or biodegradable materials. But what is already the, the problem is, is, I think, the nowadays uh, that uh, because the plastic is in the oceans, that who will pay that if that will be taken away? Because that is the, always the first question, who is paying? So that uh, means that there should be this kind of uh, cooperation uh, between different countries and areas. So talking about taking it away, that sounds more like a mechanical collection yes, option, true. which I thought we were just discussing is a very difficult one and which might not actually work so mm -hmm. well from a biodiversity standpoint either. Uh, so, thinking of other options, and we have had some discussions already about the idea that we could help the microbes be a little bit more efficient when it comes to it. Do you think there's any plausible possibility here, or what's your take on uh, that? So, I, I was also thinking this one, so that can we um, spread this kind of uh, microbes which can degrade different kind of plastics uh, there, or is that enzymes better solutions? And of course, the microbes problem is that there is no one microbe which can degrade different kind of plastics. And, uh, of course, uh, these microbes that we are spreading there, they can't be GMO, so that uh, there has to be somehow we can uh, speed up the evolution of them uh, with these classical methods and so on. But uh, in the microbes, the problem is that uh, we can't guarantee that um, they will degrade this plastic uh, to the end. So we don't want to make new problem. So that is just making smaller species that we can't see them. And also in, uh, in this microbial degradation, uh, what, for example, we have seen that some microbes are producing, for example, from polyethylene compounds uh, which might be toxic to some other microbes. So if we are spreading this kind of microbe there and it's uh, producing toxic compounds, the microbes which are already there, so we are really generating new problems. So in that sense, these kind of uh, individual enzymes might be better solutions that uh, they will uh, somehow uh, start this uh, oxygenation and, and this uh, making active compounds, uh, bonds there, so that other microbes can start uh, to utilize them. 
So, so, so start, as a starter, we can add some enzymes, maybe. So I guess, uh, listening to you, I have a whole slew of new questions that came <laughs> up in my mind, but I'm also conscious of not having just the panel here, but also asking the public. So if you have any questions, please wave your hands and, and let me know, and we'll be happy to bring you into this dialogue. Um, what I was thinking of, you, you say that GMOs is not an option. So that's a quite a strong statement. I mean, we have GMOs everywhere around us, right? I mean, we're living, in, and anyone who comes up with a poodle, you know, has a GMO, uh, you know, in the middle of their home. So why is it that you're so determined that GMOs is a bad solution? Uh, to me, it's not a problem. <laughs> But uh, for example, when I have, uh, have uh, this kind of lessons and I have said that we will modify these microbes to produce wanted products. So the first question the audience is that, is it that GMO? So, but of course, if we have to choose, uh, is that GMO or do we have the plastic waste problem? So then uh, which one is the worst? So. Okay. So I, I'm sure there are people in the audience now who might have um, some strong views about this also. So please feel free to, to jump in at this point. Um, I, I guess when I think about sort of solutions, I, I have a hard time imagining how the enzyme route would go. I mean, the fact is that this plastic is everywhere in the ocean. Yeah. This is very widely distributed. How do you actually reach uh, sort of breaking down plastic through using enzymes? Uh, that will, well, yes, because it's very diluted uh, in the ocean because it's very diluted area uh, where to spread these things. And of course, no one has tried these kind of systems. And of course, in the enzyme stage, usually, usually that they need some catalyst, uh, some reaction, some other compounds there so that they can, they can react. So that uh, this kind of robust enzyme, which is really in this kind of harsh condition, doing this kind of uh, some oxygenation and these kind of things, that then it will be very demanding. But really, that if the other choice is microbes, so then there is also bottlenecks there. Okay, Dan? The risk of manipulating with ecosystems in this way. Try again. Yes. Um, the risk of manipulating huge ecosystems um, reminds me of a discussion we had a month ago with Penny Chisholm on the prochlorococcus because as that is a carbon dioxide consuming, oxygen producing and carbon producing organism, and people were hoping that this can be used to reduce carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and that is dissolved in the oceans. But she responded that that wouldn't work because if um, Prochlorococcus starts producing a lot of bound carbon, that will be a fuel for methanogens, and they will produce methane, and we, it will make it even worse than the carbon dioxide. So uh, we really have to think carefully. Uh, but it, it's a bit... Um, uh, I, I was hoping that it would be possible to generate organisms that can speed up uh, the consumption of plastics, the degradation of plastics. Uh, so is there absolutely no way that we can do that? Do we have to wait for the slow processes that seem to be occurring? Well, uh, I think the problem is that uh, because there is not only one kind of plastic. So if we know that there is only polyethylene, so then I think we can handle and find microbes which are degrading and producing metabolites that uh, other ones can accept. But there is also polystyrene, so that there is aromatic compounds, what most, most likely maybe degradation products from there, and, and from PET. And, and these ones might be, uh, not harmful, might be harmful to these uh, microbes which are already there. So this should be first mimi, uh, mimic in some, some kind of laboratory conditions to see that, uh, and, and how much, for example, there is coming this kind of metabolites which one might be very toxic. Because, for example, uh, we have seen that uh, uh, polyethylene, when it's degraded, most likely they will come uh, short chain deacids. Uh, and, and these short chain deacids, uh, you need only micrograms or milligrams. And, and even this kind of uh, eukaryotic fungi can't live there. So in that sense, uh, in the bacteria cases, we are making the selection pressure that uh, some other some microbes might be there, but some uh, sensitive ones are not anymore there. So that should be first tested in laboratory scale before spreading these uh, uh, microbes uh, there. And, and then also one thing is that uh, uh, in the different uh, ocean stage, different salinity, different temperatures, and so on. So there is not one microbe, so it should be in the local uh, solution. 
and uh, to find out. Uh, there is many enzymes, yes, that's, uh, that's the reason I was thinking more about enzyme size, because then they are there three months and they are degraded and so on. And, and, and we know that enzymes, what is the end product from this reaction. But then with micros, we don't know exactly that, uh, because there is different kind of substrate, that what will be the end outcome. Because microbes, of course, they want to... Uh, uh, um, secret around these kind of compounds that other microbes can't live there. So in that sense, that's uh, this kind of selection what is ongoing all the time. Yeah, I just want to make a comment there. Uh, so I think we need to depart from that vision of adding a superbug that can can degrade everything mm -hmm. or accelerate the process. Even uh, I think that's kind of the wrong way to go. I, I, I think that the potential to degrade the plastics is already there, but we have to consider the potential in those organisms that are already there, perhaps know what makes them tick. And mm -hmm. uh, to be honest, I mean, it's a fierce competition between all the microbes out there for also other resources for space mm -hmm. even. Mm -hmm. So it has to be a situation where the organisms would really benefit from that extra energy or that extra mm -hmm. carbon or nutrients that would come from the plastics and being able to mobilize that. And you wouldn't really find that in this dilute environment where you have very few plastic particles. I mean, of course, you, in reality, you have very few plastic particles in the ocean if you compare to other resources that's available. And then they would just be outcompeted. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that possibly in, in some instances where you have a concentration of these particles, that's why you would, should look and try to figure out from an ecological point of view, really, what features nutrient scarcity, nutrient conditions, redox, other things uh, that would be ideal for the process. I think that would be a feasible approach to at least accelerate the process. I'm not sure we can, uh, so, so we can the solve the you, problem. Uh, but I, I hear that you say we don't have enough plastic in the ocean and the problem is we need a <laughs> high concentration. From a, just from, facetious. from a plastic degraders <laughs> point of view, we don't have enough <laughs> plastics in the ocean. <laughs> anyway, um, looking at it in an analogous situation, you mentioned the oil industry. I know the Exxon, for example, after Exxon Valdez put an enormous amount of money into looking at these Plus, oil degrading type of bacteria and whether or not there would be some merit into sort of seeding the recovery process. And as it turned out in Alaska, the first thing they did was basically washing with boiling water on the rock and the sands where the oil had come in. That ensured that there would be no weathering because the oil actually went into the, soil, uh, to the sediment and to the sand where it probably still resides in a number of cases because it's been a much slower decomposition. It was actually on top, it would have weathered much quicker. But also I understood from that research that what really worked was fertilizing these areas. And that's what really was speeding up the bacteria that was capable of decomposing the oil. So do you want to say a little bit about that? No, I mean, I think that's a reasonable way of thinking about it at least, because if you add that huge amount of carbon that you're dealing with in terms of the oil, you know, you're going to be short of nitrogen or phosphorus and other nutrients. So, so I would think that having plenty of those resources around would accelerate biological activity and it would promote the organisms that would be capable of doing that degradation work. So do we have anyone doing um, deep sea um, microbes here? Because one of the interesting questions, of course, is what's happening on the bottom. And you talked a lot about the surface layers, but you know, the bottom is normally quite a nutrient-starved environment. There's, there's a little bit of snow falling down with some small organic matter, but it's not an enormous amount. And in fact, lots of the species that survive are capable of starvation through you know, not exerting a lot of energy and until they find the next feeding opportunity. So that points in the direction that if you have enough frequency of uh, plastic, it still is a significant and interesting carbon deposit with energy content, which might be of interest. And of course, most of the microbes live off the whole idea of uh, whatever rains down on them. So they're already predisposed to composing you know, all kinds of different types of carbon. So they're, they're probably quite a few of them are omnivores as well from that perspective. So I don't know, do you have a perspective on that? Yes, I have a perspective on that. So, I mean, the, the deal, what you're dealing with there is also a shortage of other resources, which sure. is like oxygen, right? If you don't have oxygen or other good electron acceptors, things will slow down just because you're going to limit the, the kind of thermodynamic space for, for acquiring energy for growth. 
so I think that's something that slows things down. But but you're you're right, you know, in in the sense that it's an energy limited system, then these perhaps more hard to access resources will become gradually more important for the organisms. They would, the ability to, to use them, to exploit them, would give the organisms a competitive advantage. So it's something that would promote them. So, so maybe that's, that's where you should look, right? I mean, there's sediment bottom. OK, I've heard you loud and clear. I think we'll come back to this question. I, I wanted to bring in Stephanie again. Now, one of the, the questions that we talked about earlier is the sludge coming out of wastewater treatment plants. And of course, this is something that we're spreading around in our environments to a great degree. What do you see as the health risks of that, given that they contain a lot of plastic? Yeah, well, it would all depend, I guess, on the, the size distribution of the plastics within the sludge um, and whether that's aerosolized at any point during the spreading. So, I mean, typically during sort of dry, arid weather um, and the sludge spreading season, um, for example, in air quality, you do you get a, a signal, an ammonia signal from that activity. So it does affect air quality, and we do know that very fine particles are aerosolized in that way. Um, we have no idea if microplastics are carried or, or are aerosolized via that mechanism too. Um, but so that would be the first thing, whether they actually become airborne. Um, and then the second thing, of course, when we talk about exposure, would be the, the size distribution, because we're talking about the lungs and the airway, then we're talking about very small particles with an aerodynamic diameter of 10 microns or below um, to enter the central airway and further. Um, so those would be the two key questions. Um, we don't know. We are working on it at the moment. We're going to uh, hopefully start measuring, doing some microplastics airborne measurements and looking at the different chemical signatures for other pollutants so we can start to kind of tease out where things might be coming from or what the source, geographical sources or source activities might be. So when we're looking at um, water treatment plants, of course we, we have primary, secondary, and tertiary treatment, and one of the things we are trying to do is break down other things that we think are toxic and that we don't want to release into the environment. Now, can you give us some sense of, could we add some other bacteria into uh, the treatment of the sludge so we would significantly reduce the plastic component? I think there is, um, well, uh, there is also, I think, this kind of competition situation so that if we had this, had this kind of microbe, it is not usually there, that are they there enough long time so that because first, I think they used more easier carbons than, than plastic. And, and so that, um, and this timing so that, because these microbes, they are very slow without any modifications so that at least they can start to this uh, degradation there. But then how long time it will take, so that's, that's the question. So, I mean, combining the idea that you often get biofilms if you have it in a liquid type of form, with the fact that you're going to put them in a field where they might reside over extended periods mm -hmm. of time, I mean, in some ways you could inoculate them to be broken down over a mm -hmm. period of weeks, months, something like that. So you wouldn't necessarily need to do it, you know, at 70 degrees mm -hmm. within 24 hours. I mean, you, you could have a sort of a, a little bit of a delayed breakdown, but it would still be sufficiently long if it was treated the right way in the mm -hmm. field to not cause as much of a problem. Do, do you think there's a possibility well, there? Uh, at, at least in theory, yes. But in okay. practice, I don't know. But that's, uh, so, so someone yeah. else having a problem with this approach? I mean, does this make any sense? Or? Thank you. Uh, so I'm not an absolute expert in this area here, but I just I have colleagues that work with uh, thermal uh, treatment of, of, of sludge, and I was just wondering whether that could be comparable because microplastic in sludge is potentially a problem. We know that chemicals in sludge is a huge problem, and very few of them are regulated. So we have a lot of uh, chemicals in the sludge that we don't even measure for. Mm -hmm. So. If we were sort of treating this lot, and I think we need to do that because we need the phosphorus, there's no doubt about that. I think a methodology that could address both the organic chemicals and the plastic would be preferable to something that would just target one of them. I don't know if you want to, if you have any comments on that. Uh, I think that that's, that's a good idea because then uh, really these semi cross because they can also uh, degrade these BAH compounds and these kind of things so that uh, they, they can purify this kind of and I'm really making this kind of mixture that they can uh, then really degrade these uh, harmful compounds from there. But it's really this timing that how long time it will take, so that's, uh, that's I think the question. 
you could also envision that you had some microbes that were quite you know, uh, particular when it comes to what they would feed off. So, you know, that would be sturdy enough to survive, but, you know, given that there's a lot of plastic in the sludge, you know, mm. there'd probably be enough food for them to be able to, to do only that. Now, they might be not as fast growing as some other things, but that isn't necessarily a problem if they can continue the process mm. once they leave a treatment plant. Do you have any perspective on that? Um, yes, because, well, the truth is that, uh, well, plastic is a uh, polymer, it is very long, so if you think that uh, glucose, what is usual, this kind of carbon, is six carbon and plastic is uh, how many thousand carbon, so that there is plenty of energy. So even it's uh, degrading one polymer, uh, there is already quite much energy, so that, uh, uh, so that in that sense, uh, these microbes will get energy into this kind of uh, one polymer. So that, uh, in that sense, that it's only degrade this one and, and, and utilize the biomass and CO2, uh, that might be a really, really uh, long time uh, process. Okay. I have a, a yes, question please. for the microbiologists. Um, if we're finding lots of Vibrio on colonizing plastic, is that because it likes eating plastic? Mm, I, I don't know. I don't know. That's uh, because I, I heard that it's uh, want to be some surveys and, and so on, so that uh, that's might be one reason. Well, vibrios are really capable of degrading a variety of polymers, and it has been shown that some vibrios are also capable of degrading some plastics. Um, whether or not that's the key mechanism, I mean, they Probably really like they really like to sit on, on surfaces, you know, for for different reasons. I Maybe mean, it's just an evolutionary adaptation to survive for extended periods of quite poor conditions out in the oceans before they get into a gut and really thrive. So vibrios are friends, not foe, is what you're trying to tell us here. So, okay, that's an interesting <laughs> perspective. Please. This was, uh, Please use the microphone close to your face. Uh, you have a different kind of polymers, and if you have a chain that is carbon, 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 uh, there is no enzyme that is cutting carbon, carbon bond. So you need first to go through an oxidation as a first step and the mechanism, and usually you need first to have this in solution. That means that you need to have low enough molecular weight. So you get down the molecular weight uh, like heat or like oxygen and so on and so on. Because in my experiments like with paraffin, it was the paraffin with C32 was degrading, but not C36. But then if I, there were done experiments by others with different temperature and so on. So there are many limitations when it comes to these big molecules that have to go in different things. But then you have all the polyesters with double bonds mm -hmm. and with the esters and they degrade. They did a lot of experiments, a group with Potts and Eckward in the 1970s, where they showed the growth of different polyesters depending on the distance between uh, the ester groups and the closer distance, the more growth. And they also showed that it was, um, if, if the ester bond was hide by other groups or it was a plain chain. So, of course, but growth in itself doesn't mean anything with degradation because, you know, they are just using it as a, something to grow on and they are using other substrate for the growth. So well, I think the interesting question we had from your possession was the fact that you had very different type of growth from different types of organisms, depending on you know, uh, how the shape was. So part of it could also be three-dimensional sort of settling and you know, what, what in some ways is also the adhesive qualities of the, the material they're settling on. So it could be a whole range of other reasons for why it behaves the way it does. But I, I think it's a, a very interesting question to, to probe some more. Now, I wanted to turn this discussion in, in a slightly different direction. So, um, one of the things we've heard a lot about coral reef restoration right now is uh, the idea that, you know, a lot of the reefs of the world have died, maybe as much as half of the Great Bear Reef has died in the last three years or so. We have a, a, a real crisis on our hands where we're seeing a whole ecosystem collapsing largely due to human burning of fossil fuels. So, you know, some of these coral heads are a thousand years old. We know this hasn't happened in a thousand years. So that's, that's a rather dramatic type of event. Now, a lot of people are sort of crying, you know, what can we do to do this? 
um, uh, to, to stem this tide or perhaps find solutions. And one that is being pursued right now is looking at the genetics of corals. What is it that makes corals more resistant? And also looking at the zooxanthellae, the symbiotic um, algae that they are actually feeding off and whether or not one could also do something with the genetics there. So do you think this sort of playing God in nature has a future? I mean, I know this is a slightly colored way of putting it, but I mean, do you think this is a, a way forward given that we're at a very severe crisis point? Do you want to well, start? Yeah. Well, I feel we've already been playing God in a way by causing all these impacts um, for however many years now, but... Um, I don't know, because the whole time I've been listening to you guys talking about like potentially seeding parts of the ocean with enzymes or microbes, for me, the question is, what does that mean on an ecosystem level? If you've got an influx of something, it's going to change the balance in some way, mm -hmm. and that could be a negative or not, I don't know. So, uh, pff, I don't know. I think it's tricky, isn't it? Because what kind of repercussions can you instill from all the changes that you could make, I don't know, for, for me a gut feeling says no, <laughs> let's just be cleaner. <laughs> just, just let's <laughs> just see the die, the die off from Not the corals the die and, and throw up Let's just try and <laughs> minimise our impacts. <laughs> No, for sure, but you know, we're we're the house is on fire, right? Yeah. It's not like you know, we're we're in an emergency situation. <laughs> yeah. What's the options to pretend that? Oh, let's hope it goes well. Yeah. You know, it's, it's maybe a little bit too too hopeful as well. Um, yeah. Harry? Well, uh, well, I think that there is this kind of um, ideas uh, uh, so that um, to rebuild this kind of coral so so that this uh, it, where they are bound and so on, so that they will be area. That, that they can rebuild, uh, for example, a little bit colder weather, where, uh, whatever where they are now. So in this kind of uh, renovation might be possible, but that's, that's, that's only minority what, what we can save. Yeah, so, so we've been looking at the whole idea of reef restoration using various type of, for example, spiders where you attach certain corals and you can have a mix of corals mm -hmm. and you actually, within two or three years in a healthy reef environment, get them to regrow really nicely. Mm -hmm. The problem though is, you know, they cost maybe, best case scenario, six dollars a pop and, you know, to build a, a hectare you maybe need 500 mm -hmm. or more and to build, you know, the Great Bear Reef you need a lot of them and the question is, is there even any chance? Plus, you don't have a guarantee, you won't have the same problem with the next bleach bleaching event where they might die anyway. So it, it's not a given to me that you know, this is uh, as good an option as a genetic option where the corals are just sturdier. If we look at the northern Red Sea, for example, these reefs have for a very long time sustained very large temperature variations. So they're really adapted to that. Now, that's sort of the environment we're heading into for a lot of other reefs as well. And then the question is, is there something to learn from that? <clears throat> yes, um, first uh, I thought when you were um, in the beginning uh, I, was, I was fearing that you were going to suggest that we should do plastic reefs instead. <laughs> uh, no, just, just kidding. Yeah. Uh, I, I would like to, to, um, to s maybe switch the conversation to uh, instead of having the aspect of uh, having the help of bacteria to, to, de to degrade the plastics once the plastic is in the environment. We, we talked about today and the study that uh, Christian showed, I think it was uh, that the media was getting so interested when we saw effects on humans. So if we look at, go back into the, the negative aspect with the bacteria and that we looked upon today and the aspect with the uh, Vibrio and, and other uh, pathogens uh, colonizing the plastic, is there any uh, study that you are uh, aware of that where we really have seen uh, that we can couple a some epidemiological studies on with humans on that where the plastic has been a dominating link for for those diseases. Do do we have any such case? Do you uh, know or Christian maybe knows. Yeah, yes. I might want to pass you to Christian. <laughs> Jack. Um, I, I think that the epidemiological studies that we have that relates to that is from the plastic industry and uh, we have studies that have shown that uh, pregnant women that has been working in the plastic industry has uh, a high incidence of uh, children with uh, birth defects so due to the endocrine disrupting chemicals that are typically used in the plastic industry so we have 
There's a study from Puerto Rico some years ago where they showed that, and they showed they, they measured uh, how early the, the girls from the mothers that worked in the industry when they went into puberty. And I think the worst case was a two-year-old girl that started developing breast already. So I think these are the epidemiological data that we have. I don't think there's anything that have, anyone that had produced epidemiological data of plastic, microplastic like that. But it, it, problems related to plastic then is very much related to the endocrine disrupting chemicals that are used as additives in, in, uh, for plasticizers. I know there is uh, one study which looked at uh, macroplastic litter on a terrestrial environments as a breeding ground for mosquitoes. And so there's a connection between pot potentially a higher transfer of malaria due to an influx of mosquitoes. And because they were sort of, um, it was an extra substrate or pooling water if, for them to lay eggs. And so I guess that's one element is vector-borne diseases in insects and the idea that bigger bits of plastic are a sort of substrate for enhanced oviposition and, and breeding to occur in or on. I mean, the other interesting one recently was the, the idea when you have plastic smothering a coral, mm. it actually leads yeah. to the death through infections and things. Yeah. So it's not necessarily that you turn off the energy production only, but it's also related to that this is a significant stressor yeah. and it brings pathogens to the corals that mm -hmm. kills them. And if you look at some areas, you know, you have plastic everywhere. I mean, we was out in Indonesia last year and I, I was absolutely mind blowing. And this is the second largest uh, polluter of the ocean right now. It's a horrifyingly large amounts of plastic that goes into it, which means practically every single mangrove I saw had plastic on it. Mm -hmm. And many of the corals I saw actually had plastic pieces on it. So, that in itself then becomes a significant reason for, for th you know, uh, things dying. Sorry, I think, should we continue? Yeah. I, I just had also a comment to that. So I think that one of the things also, if you look at plastic waste and the association with pathogens, that's a really important aspect, not just for the microplastic, but also because the plastic waste is destroying the ecosystem services, destroying uh, tourism, destroying fisheries, these kind of things. So people, they remove it. Obviously, they do beach cleanup, all these type of cleanups, and they're not aware that there are these different kind of pathogens associated with it. So it's, that's a really vector for, for, for pathogens. So we did some sampling in Zanzibar last year where we found a lot of pathogen cholera and multi-resistant salmonella bacteria on, on the plastic waste. And, and the local people, they collect this because they need to get rid of that. And then they sit down and they have their lunch afterwards. And that's a really important vector, I think, for, for, for human pathogens. I guess from the microplastics side, at least marine microplastics, when you think of our exposure, it's via the food chain and so via, um, I don't know, shellfish, for example. And the majority of shellfish we cook before we eat. And so in theory, I guess that should destroy any pathogenic activity in there, but who knows? But oysters, we don't, exactly. to a large degree. Yeah, so so this is another we nail we in the coffin to yeah. those of us who love oysters. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I also um, hear a lot about people um, sort of worrying about uh, plastics. I mean, it, like with all things, I mean, I remember growing up, we had the nuclear winter and a lot of people were very afraid of that. I mean, we know that as humans, if we worry about things, we actually don't feel very well. And that actually also exacerbates some of the problems. Do you have any sense of sort of what's the risk of people like us going out there telling people that it's a great risk? Mm. <laughs> yeah. um, probably quite bad. I try and keep be the level-headed voice in whenever I'm contacted by the media because um, there's definitely momentum and excitement at the moment and the public are really engaged with the plastics issue and uh, the media have cottoned onto that. And I think there is a lot of sensationalization out there, um, perhaps unfounded in, in some respect. And there's just so many unknowns, but then maybe that adds, adds fuel to the fire because we don't know. So there's always this possibility that maybe it is, you know, having an effect and it's sort of this massive emergency. Um, so I think there's definitely uh, overstate in the media. Um, that's not backed up by scientific evidence so far, because really based on the scientific evidence that we have, um, that we're not in a position to say that microplastics cause harm. And that's mainly because we don't really know, based on what we know we're exposed to, it's actually very low compared to lots of different particles. You know, it's, I don't know, I think the re recent estimates are a few thousand particles per week, which is actually very 
that's very small compared to other particles. Uh, just a follow-up on that and relating to your research, uh, I thought now we, we, if we quit the ocean and we look at uh, what you said, <coughs> we, we say that uh, fibers are everywhere and, and you say that you're looking at uh, what humans get exposed through through the air and are there any um, toxicity studies on humans that show that there is an increase of uh, respiratory diseases or anything linked to those uh, plastic particles? So there are occupational studies um, sort of from the 70s and, and 80s through to early 90s which looked at synthetic textile workers and exposure to respirable plastic dust. Um, so these were textile workers who worked in either plants which fine cut uh, nylon filaments, um, which is known as flock, or worked in other uh, textile processing plants. And so it's not the it's not necessarily fibers that were getting into the airway, but it was like respirable dust generated from cutting the fibers, which were also plastic in composition. And um, there's actually a disease called flock workers' lung, which is an occupational disease. It's an interstitial lung disease, um, which is rare, but is reported uh, uh, in these in these workers. And it's essentially it's a peribronchiolar. Um, uh, pneumonia type in inflammatory disease. Um, it has its own clinical uh, diagnosis and pathology. So what I find interesting actually is that the reported symptoms are very similar to uh, cotton workers, for example, but the pathologies are very different, which indicates that the molecular initiating events are also different. So building this idea on whether it's a polymer effect or a particle or fiber effect uh, but yes, yeah, so there's quite a bit of occupational literature that suggests chronic inflammation and, and possibly interstitial lung disease, which over a longer period of time that can lead to pulmonary fibrosis, which isn't good. But it's important to say there's very high exposures, <laughs> so not like what we experience um, outside yeah, or inside. To, yeah, for us, yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, that's also an interesting point, the synergistic effects of different types of chemicals. I mean, we know there's so many different things we put in plastic. So obviously, some of those we've heard already are toxic. Some of them we don't know if they're toxic. The combination of several of them, we certainly don't know if they're toxic. So there's a lot of unknowns in terms of that. And that obviously pushes you in the uh, realm of being more cautious about how you're going about it. So when we think of sort of how do we tackle this health risk here. Do you, do you have any ideas of how we would better uh, understand uh, the risks and how we could limit them a little bit more? So I think at the moment we do measure outcomes associated with, for example, particulate matter and exposure to particulate matter. Um, and we sort of measure that in its entirety. And we're starting to pull apart the different components, so looking at black carbon and metals and PAHs and all the different elements there and, and endotoxin, for example and sort of try to understand the relative contribution that each component has, which of course is important for, for uh, improving public health because it directs where we might need to remediate or have legislation in place. Uh, but we've not started doing that for plastics yet. <laughs> so plastics are probably, if, you know, um, we've been making them or in mass producing them since the 50s, but they're in the air. They've probably been in the air for a while. For example, we've got, we know about tire wares and, and fibres and, and uh, so they've probably been in our environment for a while, so our exposure to them probably isn't new, it's just a new, we've newly recognised it. Um, so if there is any health effects, it's probably being measured in these particulate matter um, effects we observe, but we have no idea because we've not really teased that relative contribution out yet. Well, I think another question is, I mean, as we go along, we've come up with all kinds of new additives and we changed and completely new types of plastic. So, I mean, a lot of the more dangerous ones might be in the last five years, so we might not have seen those health effects. I mean, there could be a lag effect here until you actually see yeah, that coming in. That's true. And for example, say we know, you know, um, flame retardants, for, just as a, a common example, we measure them in air pollution in indoor and outdoor air, more commonly in indoor environments and urban environments, but they're there. Um, but what we don't know is whether they're there because they're associated with microplastic or if they're there because they've leached out and they're in their particulate form or they've attached to other particles. So. Other questions from the audience here? Yes. Yes. 
I wonder uh, how you can uh, measure the combined effects, because I, I remember uh, when uh, the debate was about the, the risk with asbestos fibers, and uh, the results showed that the combination of asbestos fibers and people who were smokers was really devastating, while without this combination it was uh, not even close as risky. And uh, I can uh, imagine that, uh, for instance, risk with uh, fibers, textile fibers, could be maybe uh, something similar, that uh, because they have some uh, increased risk because of the shape of, of the particle, and maybe also the combination with some pollutants in the air or, or other chemicals could have similar effect. Yeah. Can you comment something on this? Sure. Um, yeah, definitely. I think, uh, so the key things with asbestos uh, is durability, uh, dose, dimension and durability. And so I kind of see dimension and dose as interlinked because the dimension indicates where in the airway it will deposit, which indicates where you'd receive the dose. And so asbestos fibres are typically very thin, um, less than three microns diameter, and often the most toxic effects are seen when they're relatively long, so at least over 10 microns and, and up to sort of 100 microns in length. Um, the other thing to consider though is that they're very rigid, and so they're kind of, I guess, they behave a bit like a javelin in an airstream. But that means that they've, their di di dimension means that they have the, the capability to reach deep into the lungs, so into the pleura, which is where they cause their mesophilioma effect. So with plastic fibres, um, yes, they're fibrous, but currently our measured dimensions are very different. So we've not measured anything in the environment that would be small enough to reach that same site in the body. Um, but, you know, I'm sure if they did occur in that size range, it would be plausible. And yes, because they can absorb hydrophobic organic contaminants. But I'd say it's all, it's plausible, it's conjecture, but we, I think we definitely need to measure it. And I think we just need to really refine our measurements and, and try and push a boundary of what we can see to detect the, if these thin fibres exist. So I know the synthetic textile industry does produce ultra-fine polyester fibres, for example, uh, which have a diameter less than one micron, but I have no idea if they're released or shed or degraded in the same way or, or if they even occur in the environment. Thank you. So um, talking about these nano um, plastic particles, do you, do you have any sense of their risk factors? Or where, where would you see the biggest issues associated with nanoparticles? So. Typically in particle toxicology, uh, the smaller the particle, the, the greater the toxic potential or bioreactivity because it's got an increased surface area to volume ratio. And so uh, in nanos, we kind of have this surface charge paradigm um, classically where uh, if a particle's got a, um, a positive charge, then it's more toxic than other types of particle. But what we know from ageing in the environment and weathering is that microplastics seem to go the other way. So I'm not sure how applicable the surface charge paradigm will be to plastics. Um, I'd certainly suggest that, or it would be indicated that nano-sized plastics would be more of a, a hazard because they've got a greater potential for a wider distribution in the body to be taken into cells, to accumulate in um, target tissues, as opposed to the larger microplastics. And also if we think about contaminant load, um, if there's a greater surface area, it can deliver a greater load as well. But I think at the moment, uh, there's still too many unknowns as to what, what ageing does. I mean, I, I think, and Ignacy probably knows more than me, I think it increases hydrophilicity. Uh, and hydrophobicity is typically uh, believed to be a more toxic um, characteristic. Um, but then hydrophilicity means that it's capable of binding cationic metals, for example, um, which are redox catalysts. And so that's obviously a risk, and the smaller the particle, the bigger the risk for that. So, okay, so it's quite a complex picture there. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, no, that's, that's absolutely fine. Do you, yeah, no, yeah, sorry. so that's um, in this healthy health issue about this microplastic or nanoplastic. So, is the what kind of plastic is that? Polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene. 
the difference is because if thinking that uh, if we are gener generating this kind of microbial or enzyme systems that it decreases some specific enzyme, uh, plastic smaller pieces, so that what should I avoid? Yeah. What is the worst plastic material in sense of he health issue? Uh, well, so if you consider just the polymers alone, classically we consider something with an aromatic ring in its structure to be more toxic than something without. So, for example, polystyrene. Um, also considering the plastic polymers, um, we know their monomers can be carcinogenic and uh, mutagenic, and I think it's acrylonitrile is a very toxic monomer, and styrene as well. Um, but, you know, from a, a polymer particle sense, we don't really know if there's a burden of monomer, if that can leach or not. Um, I know that there's literature on um, plastic prosthetic wear debris, so where you have plastic joint resurfacing uh, in the body, and the wear and tear of that over time obviously releases me like mechanical wear particles, um, which can trigger inflammation in the surrounding joint tissue. And obviously there we use ultra uh, medical grade plastics. Um, we can use polyethylene or polyethylene terephthalate. And for some reason, polyethylene terephthalate triggers a greater immune response than we see towards polyethylene. So I think there's some, perhaps some uh, characteristics in the actual structure that might trigger a different or, or a greater inflammatory response. Um, and yeah, there's certain structural uh, characteristics that we'd consider more toxic, but I don't think we've really done a, uh, an in-depth assessment, in, in, an in vitro mm -hmm. assessment of that, really, testing the or comparing those characters in plastics. Mm -hmm. right, we... I would like <coughs> to comment on uh, nanoplastics, because uh, it, the, the conception of nanoplastic uh, was created uh, from the idea that large plastic are degraded to smaller pieces and to microplastics and, and some kind of logical next step is nanoplastics. But we have to take into consideration what kind of sizes we are talking about. Of course, we can imagine some mechanical abrasion a special abrasion, uh, and especially when people are using ni liquid nitrogen to trying to to create some nanoplastic. But in the nature, it is very unlikely that something like this would happen. And we try to to produce nanoparticles by abrasion of of thermoplastics like polyethylene, and we couldn't succeed without using liquid nitrogen and, and very special tools. If we, uh, then, this is one way. The, another way is by degradation. But then we have to think that the size of a random coil of a polymer is in the range of 100 nanometers. This is original size of a polymer. So to come down to nano particles, plastic particles, means that the polymer chain must be degraded, heavily degraded. And at this stage, and especially if we are talking about the environment, because we cannot find any nano particles in the environment, and if we are talking, for instance, about polyethylene, which is the most common polymer, or, or polypropylene, then the degrad I show how the polymers are degraded. But before we even reach any nano-sized particles, microorganisms will uh, colonize this particle and will utilize carbon uh, as an energy source. So, to find this type of particles in the environment, I think it will be easier to find a needle in the house stack. And then well, that's an optimistic thought, so at least maybe we need to worry less about the nanoparticles. Um, for sure, we don't have liquid nitrogen flowing through environment very often. So, um, 
I'm also sensitive to the fact that uh, we've had a long day and some of us might be nodding off soon. So uh, would you like to have any closing statements or a few reflections? Um, I don't know. I, I thank you for that comment because uh, you're the expert, so it's good to, to hear that opinion. Um, and I completely take that. Um, I guess the only other angle is that where you also obviously produce them and so I know, for example, nanoplastics are added to toiletries. Um, you know, in facial scrubs, they've been extracted from that. Um, we've got the, the role of the krill <laughs> and their um, digestive, what is it, the mechanical digestive mill and, and how that produces nano. So I accept, yeah, that the, the maybe weathering's not a pathway to the formation of them, but they're still probably getting in there somewhere, somehow. Um, and I guess I just want to say thank you for having me because it's been a really great um, opportunity. You're a really nice bunch of people doing lots of cool research. So it's been great to, to learn all about it. So thanks for having me. Thank you very much. So, Curry. yes, so first uh, we are looking in this biotech uh, some solution which might compensate the existing recycling systems and also in part, partly solve this problem in the future. And I also thank you that you invited me. Yeah, because it has been very nice uh, symposium to see the same problem with different angles. Mm -hmm. So that I have, I, at least I have learned quite a lot here yes, during you. these two days. <laughs> so thanks to organizers. Thank you very much. So a round of applause for our panel. <laughs> so we only have one more point on the agenda, and I think we'll move straight into that. I think Leif, uh, you will be coming down here as well. I don't know if you want to take one of these. Um, microphones as well, maybe while we're getting you uh, set up. I, I had a, a, a few further reflections that I might just share with you. I mean, one, of course, is, I mean, I think the fact that we're talking about nanoparticles could also be a reflection of the idea that it's bigger than one nano. It could be 10 or it could be 100. So I, I, I think that's maybe just sloppy ways of categorizing it. So if you look at it from that perspective, it might still have significant impacts in our bodies. So that's just something to do. Now, Leif, do you want to start? Because you've actually, unlike me, take notes during this whole event and I think are a little bit more on top of uh, collecting some of the thoughts and some of the outcomes. Yeah, well, I will not uh, uh, try to summarize everything. I've taken notes here because the intention is that we should produce a little document from this uh, symposium. Uh, and we will... Uh, First, write a draft, circulate it among the, the organizers, and then we will send it to all the speakers and, and the members of, of the panels here so that they can have a look and so we don't write something that is totally stupid. Uh, but I will allow myself one sort of reflection here, and that is from what I learned here is uh, the majority of the plastic in the ocean is actually at the sediments. And the, there's not really very high concentrations in, in at least not microplastics in, in the surface, which is reassuring because uh, that's where most of the fish that we catch at least is living. Uh, but we have a lot of microplastics and uh, that's probably the easiest uh, part to, to uh, do something about. Uh, and uh, of course we shouldn't even let it be into the ocean. But what the fraction that we have sitting at least on the deep ocean bottoms, I can't really see that we have to worry too much about it from an environmental and health aspect. So to me, I think it, this has enlightened me that there is a problem, but there's a problem that we can do something about. And I don't think we have to send in any bugs or anything like that. We can, we can do do something just on land and the coasts. And I think that will be very useful. And uh, that, I think, so I go home with a positive feeling here. And I think that's fine for me. So, and I also want to thank everyone that came here. I'd like to thank all the speakers, all the panel leaders, and not at least Peter and Elin, who has been doing all the practical arrangements here. Without them, we would not have even um, well, had any food, for instance, or coffee. So thank them very much. Right, so I, Don, do you want to say anything before we end, or you? 
Um, I, I just thought I would say a couple of words also. I mean, I, I, I guess I, I love the idea of being optimistic and positive about these things, and, and for sure for us at IUCN, my team in the back there, uh, Mina and Joao, uh, this has been a very positive experience, and I, I would love to do another one of these uh, symposium down the road. Um, I think from we have many things that we've learned, I think, from, from this uh, uh, sessions, and, and I think one of the ones that was a take-home message for me, though, is that how much we actually don't know. I mean, I, I, as always, when I talk to scientists, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that you might get an answer to one question, but you get ten more questions that you walk away with, and, and I think we certainly have that here. And I, I perhaps would be a little bit more cautious to say I, I don't think we know a lot of the things which we need to know to be a little bit sure about what's going on. Uh, also, when it comes to the idea of uh, doing something about the plastic on the bottom of the ocean, I, I think I'm more inclined to try to see what we could do to speed it up. I mean, the idea that we should give this legacy not just for our children or their children, but hundreds of years into the future is still something that troubles me, and I don't think we necessarily, as a, as a generation, will, will want to be remembered as the, the people that created the Plastocene. So I, I think we do have a responsibility here. Um, I also think it'd be good to think and harness the excitement and, and all the good work that's been done, and, and that's when I also wanted to invite the speakers down afterwards to have just a couple of minutes where we could uh, discuss a couple of next steps. So, so if there's possible, for those of you who are still here, we would love to, to see you down here just afterwards. But with those few words, I leave over to Dan. Yeah, so let me just add that I have learned a lot of things too. I think this has been a very uh, interesting and uh, a thoughtful discussion and we've turned the problems around many times. Um, the, the remark that uh, I will keep in mind and I think gives room for an optimistic view on this is what Christian said. There are no plastic deniers out there. So in, in, in that way, we have an easier situation to try to combat this problem. So um, let's go out and keep working on this. And I wish everyone a safe journey home. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>